Arts, Lifestyle, SNS Online. come back from a spa holiday yeah which was shit <laughs> yeah it was just a week working in a little supermarket <laughs> my dad's motto in life was never a borrower nor a lender be which is why he lost his job at the British Library <laughs> I've got a new girlfriend hey. hey thank you very much thank you yeah my new girlfriend's kinky yeah, or as she prefers to say, she's got a twisted spine. <laughs> Love at first sight when I met her though, because I met her, I met her while she was working at a zoo. Yeah. There she was, covered in monkey shit. Straight away, I thought she's a keeper. Hello and welcome to SNS Online. My special guest today is a stand-up comedian with a pretty prolific comedic career to date, part of the Sony Award-winning writing team for Jack FM, one of the top three ever UK comedians of the year, awarded in 2014, finalist at the UK Pun Championships, gag writer for the BBC, Talk Sport and more, and with over six Edinburgh Fringe shows to his name. Welcome one and all to the fabulous, the effervescent, I never knew he wasn't. Mr. Tony Cowards. So, Tony Cowards, master of mirth and tittertasm, welcome to SNS Online. Hello. Hello there. And uh, I've got to say, your comedic uh, CV to date is pretty damn impressive. Let's take it back a little bit. Your early days. How did you get into this? It's quite a, you know, a specific skill to have and a very, you know, rewarding one. Well, uh, back in the late kind of 90s or so, I was living in London and I got really into stand up comedy and watching and going to various clubs uh, kind of in eastern North London. And uh, then uh, a friend of mine who I worked with started running a comedy night called The Comedian's Graveyard <laughs> in, yeah, in, uh, in North London. I love it. I love it already. And um, I used to go along just as, a, as, a, as an audience member to begin with. And then I used to help out a little bit with um, sort of taking money on the door or, or running the sound desk and all that sort of malarkey. Mm. Um, and then kind of bit by bit, they used to do... Their, their show was interesting because they didn't run it as a kind of normal comedy night in that, um, I don't know if you're aware, most, most comedy clubs run, they have a compare that hosts the night mm. and then three or possibly four acts. But they didn't really do that. They had um, sketches and songs and all sorts of slightly different things going on as well as the st- regular stand-up. Sort of old-time so variety were, in a way. Yeah, kind of, mm, yeah. Nice and one. So they, so they always needed people to, to sort of, play little extra parts and stuff in little sketches and things. Sure. So I, so I eventually got kind of roped into taking part in a, a little sketch. What, what we, we had, a, there was a running gag where we had the uh, comedy forensic squad. <laughs> and, um, and what would happen is when, a, when one of the comedians uh, did a joke that fell flat, we had a little siren that went off and an announcement that it had been a crime against comedy. <laughs> And we'd, we'd run on and dust down the area for prints. And, <laughs> so that was my first ever oh, on stage I love it. appearance, was as one of these people wearing, like, you know, the um, CSI kind of paper suits. Sure. I thought you might just be in a spear holder, you know, like in Shakespeare or something, you know, a comedic, a comedic <laughs> yeah, it one. Kind of, it was kind of the comedic equivalent of that, though. I was kind of just an extra. Um, so that was my first ever experience on stage. And then it, my part kind of gradually grew. Ooh, I miss this. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, I got encouraged by my girlfriend at the time. She said, oh, you're quite funny. Have you ever actually thought of trying stand-up itself? Mm. And I kind of loved stand-up, but I'd never considered doing it. And then I sort of thought, okay, why not? Then I started doing a few open spots around London, and uh, 
and and that was about 15 years ago and i'm still somehow you're playing still there doing it. that's amazing when you were very young i mean were you ODing on telly and radio comedy and uh, and who were your heroes growing up your comedic heroes yeah well i mean i'm old enough i'm a child of, of the 80s really although i was born in the 70s but growing up like so kind of i i my sort of earliest heroes were kind of tommy cooper and oh yeah Morecambe and wise definitely and, all those sort of things. So, um, and I, I, as a kid, I absolutely devoured joke books. Mm. You know, you could get all these joke books with this silly sort of kid style jokes in. I absolutely love those. <laughs> so, I, I think I've always been a bit of a fan of of just silly gags and little one liner jokes. It's a bit of a superpower, isn't it? I mean, if you've got a really good gag at the right time, and you're, you know, particularly when you're young and you're with your family. You get you know you get a bit of attention for for a couple of minutes you know when you're a seven year old and just try, <laughs> trying to sort of get yeah, out there. Absolutely. <laughs> I well, usually get it right. Quite... I usually get them wrong though. So and got <laughs> I sent think to most bed. People do. I mean, I get I I get my jokes wrong sometimes. I was I was doing a gig because of lockdown and everything. I hadn't gigged for a while, mm. and I did a gig, and I kind of um, started one joke, and uh, and I realised about halfway through I couldn't remember what the punch. Oh my god. So I kind of <laughs> sort of fudged it and moved on very quickly. But Brilliant. I was kind of like, and then afterwards I kind of, I remembered and I thought, oh yeah, I, that's why, because I kind of messed up the setup and merged the punchline and the setup all you, in one. You couldn't really return to it though. <laughs> no, 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 I, I left it. It's, uh, jokes when they go wrong, they're a bit like fireworks. You should yes. never go back. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I get most of my jokes from crackers, so that probably explains why I'm not doing what you're doing. Um, I love cracker jokes, though. They're yeah. another favourite of mine. Your education is really interesting because you study chemistry, but then you got into sound and lighting. Um, yeah. So we have our links there because I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> that's what I do in my day job. Uh, uh, yeah. And then comedian. So, I mean, what's next? Astronaut, brain surgeon? Where, where do you go from there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I need just to roll a dice and just pick a random career maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, I was always fascinated by science and everything. I, don't, I wonder mm. if that's partly why my jokes are kind of a little bit... They're almost like a science in a way. Of, yeah. of writing one-liners is quite scientific, I think. Oh, I think Jimmy Carr, Jimmy Carr once said that they're very scientific. Mm. And I kind of agree. I mean, do you think your mind is like a Rubik's Cube of comedy? Um, I, I was thinking this today, actually. I was thinking... I, I had the analogy in my head today that, that all my jokes are like um, jigsaw pieces. Mm. And... and, and and every net, but they're not just jigsaw pieces from one jigsaw. They're jigsaw pieces from thousands of hundreds of thousands of different jigsaw pieces, uh, jigsaws. And then occasionally in life, a, a, a situation will present itself where I've got the perfect piece for that jigsaw, and mm. I kind of can slot that jigsaw piece into the right place. And this is just this is more in your mind, or do you are you a bit like the great late Bob Monkhouse and have like stacks of of, of books and things scribbled everywhere? It's, it's kind of a combination of the two. There's mm. all sorts of things lodged in my brain, mm -hmm. um, jokes and ideas for jokes and and that. But yes, I do. I have ridiculous number of different notepads, um, usually all about a third to half full, because mm. um, I've then lost the notepad for a little while and then started another one. So yeah, and on my computer and on my my phone and and quite often because I I. As you're probably aware, I tweet a lot, so yeah. there's a lot of stuff on Twitter. I found a legendary joke. tweet. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I found a joke on Twitter the other day that was that had obviously not tweeted. It was stuck in my drafts, and oh. it was a joke I'd, I'd been struggling to remember. And someone had asked me about it, and I couldn't for the life of me remember it. <laughs> and and then I found it in my uh, Twitter drafts, and I thought, oh great, that's where that joke is. <laughs> Would you agree? Like the brain really needs training up to uh, be a sharp stand-up comedian. I mean, I actually went on a stand-up course years ago and we did sort of warm-up exercises where, you know, you were playing alongside, off somebody else and, uh, yeah, trying to sort of uh, percolate your mind in a comedic way. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think it's um, like any skill. Uh, mm. You kind of have to practice it and work it and develop it. Basically, jokes and comedy is kind of, is play really it's just playing mm. around and and it's being playful and whether it's with language or with physicality or or whatever i think so it, uh, 
like some people say uh, that uh, comedians are kind of born rather than taught, but mm. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think most people uh, have got a, sen- a good sense of humour and, and, and know kind of what makes them laugh, at least whether they know what makes other people laugh. But And you can develop that. Uh, it's just a case of, of, of doing it over and over again and messing around mm. and exploring ideas, playing around with it. I think that's why a lot you get a lot of sitcoms and things are written by two people as well, aren't they? That they can mm. bounce ideas off one another. I found that being a step parent, being a step parent is a bit like being a police community support officer. <laughs> yeah. Because basically, as a step parent, you're like a PCSO because you look like you've got authority. <laughs> but when it all kicks off, <laughs> No one listens to a word you say. <laughs> and basically, you, you're useless until backup arrives. Um, do you remember your first really funny joke? I mean, do you remember your first gig when you, there was that moment where you had the audience in the palm of your hand? Um, you know, was it a special euphoria moment? I think, I think those two <laughs> things might be separate occasions. I'm okay. not sure on my first gig I ever had the audience in the palm of my hand. <laughs> but yeah, I can remember my first gig. I remember being absolutely terrified. Mm. Um, in fact, for about the first fifth, well, I mean, it's still a certain nervousness sometimes now when I go on stage. But I remember for the first maybe 50 or so gigs I did, I was, I was absolutely terrified every time. So quite why I kept going back to do it, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Um, but there must have been some sort of buzz. Obviously, making an audience laugh, making strangers laugh is, is a, a wonderful, if slightly strange, um, feeling. Mm. Um, it's, it's what we were saying before about the jokes and things. They're, they're almost like a magical combination of words that you, using that combination of words, you can provoke a reaction from people you've, main, you've never even met before. Yes. Yes. Which is an is a ridiculous thing when you think about it. It's amazing and so um, yeah, so joyous as well when you've got that connection. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, you sort of just some a thought you've had brings joy and happiness and laughter to someone you've never met. It's mm. just a or, very or, odd thing. Or not. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Sometimes the words you've you've sort of the thoughts you've had bring <laughs> anger and <laughs> resentment from oh, the dear. flip side of that. Do you think everything is up for grabs in comedy? I mean, do you agree with the Gervais no rule benchmark? Um, yeah, broadly, I think. I don't. Mm. I don't think there's any subjects that can't can't be joked about. Um, they just have to be done in a, in a. I don't know. In a, they have to be funny. They have to. I think sometimes, yeah, things that you might be quite shocking, but they can still be funny. Mm, mm. Um. I think as commit, I'm not particularly uh, offensive or push the boundaries or anything. But I've said things that kind of been very near or quite even cross the line. Mm. And I think comedians we have to sometimes dance right on the very boundary of of what's yeah. access- acceptable. And and comedians will make mistakes from time to time and go across that and upset people, unfortunately. But mm. I think it's a hazard of 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 what we do. And I don't know that you you can't stop that. Because if you stop that, you stop people from um, creating and being fully open yeah. with their thoughts and their, their creativity. Absolutely. Yeah, I get that. Um, I think some people, there are comics and there are people, though, that just want to shock for for the sake of it, which I, I don't really agree with. But Yeah, but those get weeded um, out pretty soon, don't they? Yeah, I think so, mostly. C- cream rises to the yeah. surface, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about some of your gigs, Ben. I mean, some of the the big gigs you've done around the country, or indeed the world. I don't know how far you've you've travelled with them, and some of the shows like the Edinburgh, etc. What were the, some of the highlights for you? Um, well, yeah, I've, I have travelled to various places. I've, I've been over to Australia to to do the Adelaide Festival. That was oh. that was interesting. You can't get further than that. No, not really. Um, and I've done gigs in the Middle East and uh, various places around Europe. And the Isle of Man. <laughs> so. And does does for humour? Do you have to tweet the shows when you're in different parts of the world? I mean, you know, um, a little bit. Yeah, mm. I, it was interesting when I went to Australia because I took a show 
uh, basically someone had come along to see my show up in Edinburgh and they asked if I wanted to take it to Adelaide. Mm. Wow. So Amazing. obviously I took the same show, but I did have to tweak it a little bit. I, before I went, I know uh, quite a few Australian people. I just wanted to run through them to just check that the cultural references and things would work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I tweaked it a bit. But even then, when I got to Australia, I found there was um, a couple of references and jokes that just didn't really work over there. Um, and I was sort of a bit shocked. Just uh, One of them was just um, a sort of a, a commonplace phrase that I, I thought it was actually um, about Helter Skelters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we know what Helter Skelter is here. Yeah. It's like a fairground ride. Um, but they don't call them that in Australia. Mm. And so a joke I had about it, got absolutely nothing and i didn't realize until after i was i spoke to someone and they said well yeah we don't have helter skelter we don't know what they are and the only thing they associated with the helter skelter was uh, the beatles album yes and i'm guessing that was a fairly older person and the, the youngsters probably wouldn't even got that as a reference yeah. so <laughs> yeah I, I funnily enough i asked an australian i said to him so if you don't have helter skelters what do you call the um the twisty slide at a fairground and uh being quite a literal people australians the guy said to me well mate we call it the twisty slide at the fairground <laughs> well you were told I was just going to mention about comedy being on TV. Uh, TV really eats up material, doesn't it? It's not like, you know, you can yeah. keep doing the same stuff. And obviously, if you're doing lots of live gigs, that's fine. But then these gigs are then video and put on YouTube. Um, is that a problem then? Or do you find yourself percolating with so many ideas that it's just not an issue? Yeah, I've, I've never found it too much of an issue. I mean, I've never done any of the kind of um, sort of TV shows, live at the Apollos, those sort of things. Mm. Uh, where I think that becomes more of a problem if you if you've done a set on there and, and literally millions of people have seen it, then it might become a bit more of an issue when yeah. you do it in a live comedy club. I think a lot of comedians are very we worry quite a lot about repeating material because mm. um, if you get booked say for a comedy club and you go back there six months later, you're kind of worried that oh they'll have heard all this stuff before. But actually, people don't tend to remember jokes. Um, they might re they, most people remember that they found someone funny, but you, you've probably experienced it. If someone's seen a comedian, you say to them, "Oh, what did they do? What did what were their jokes?" And they'll kind of go, "Oh, can't really remember. They had a bit about a banana, and, the, yeah. and there was this bit with a baby in a pram, but <laughs> they can't. They can never remember the actual jokes." It's like trying to remember a dream. I, I, if I've heard some really good jokes, I'll actually I will pause the TV and write it down because I just <laughs> to have a few uh, in my armory, my comedic yeah. armory for later on. <laughs> Yeah, so I, th I think I, th I don't think mostly we have to worry too much about about people remembering them, and unless you become absolutely massive, super famous, mm. where people can quote. But even then, I think people then get to the stage where they quite like hearing the jokes that they know. It's yeah, because absolutely. They want to hear the greatest hits. Yeah, like Mock and Wise, of course. Yeah. So, lots of writing for other people as well for the BBC. Talk sport as well. You're a, you're a big sports fan. Um, tell us about some of those. Um, yeah, the talk sport thing was a, a while back now, but it was for the uh, for the Olympics. That was an interesting one because mm -hmm. uh, basically was writing um, these little guides to the Olympics. Um, so they were funny uh, guides to sort of to. They were kind of funny, but also to give people information about minority sports at the Olympics that people might not have been aware of. Mm. So that was good fun. Yeah, I've written for various kind of some of the BBC, the Radio 4 shows, the Now Show, News Quiz. And, and I wrote with uh, a guy called Tom Bins for his Radio 2 show, Ian de Montford, which, um, where he plays uh, a, like a spiritualist, uh, very funny character that he does. Um, so yeah, done various bits of, of writing for radio, and I wrote for a, a commercial radio station, Jack FM, mm. who became then became Sam FM. Their sort of gimmick was that they don't they don't have DJs; they just have little little um, inserts 
which was basically just one-liner jokes in between all the records. So uh, would you ever consider writing for TV? Uh, I mean, like, you know, a, a complete sitcom or something like that. And, and indeed, would you would you be in it or, or would you prefer to have actors involved? Um, I'd, I'd love to write um, a sitcom. I, I worry sometimes that one of the reasons I've um, kind of gone towards writing short little one-liner jokes is because I have quite a short attention span <laughs> and writing half an hour sitcom maybe I'd, I'd probably get slightly bored of writing it about halfway through. Um, but I have some ideas for sort of sitcoms and things. that I've got characters noted down and little bits of dialogue. It's just a case of really trying to come up with some sort of plots and storylines and, and flesh them out a bit, which is something I'm not that good at. Or, or if I could find a writing partner. Who's That's good at that. just what I was going to say. Um, so, yeah, and I, I've written for I've written for people... Uh, that have done TV, and I have written little little bits and pieces um, when people have asked me to to sort of provide jokes and gags for for things because obviously that kind of is my forte, really. Mm. Um, but yeah, I would love I would love to write longer things. I, I think I'd need to learn how to write kind of more narrative and structured stuff because I, I, maybe it'd work. But my uh, my worry is if I wrote uh, a sort of twenty five minute half an hour sitcom, it would have no plot. But just be a load of jokes <laughs> all strung together. <laughs> well, <laughs> With I, no I, real I, narrative, which I'll, might annoy people. I'm not sure. I'll give it a go anyway. Let's talk about your Twitter then. Um, you're well known for your fabulous tweets that entertain so many people. And I've just got a few here. Uh, when the first dog in space touched down on the moon, they announced the beagle has landed. Bubblegum is very expensive nowadays due to inflation. Um, when I did a gig at the Owl Sanctuary, it was a hoot. And I really turned some heads. I love them. I love them all. Excellent. Some people call, call them kind of dad jokes a little bit, don't they? But yeah, but I love dad I love jokes. I'm, I'm of the age of those. Woke up this morning, had bubble and squeak for breakfast. Yeah, and now I've got to buy the kids two new hamsters. <laughs> and I went to the garden centre today as well. Went to the garden centre, just spent a couple of hours standing in the middle of my garden. <laughs> so, yeah, so no, I've never been good at relationships, so Joe, and I've, uh, I've been terrible at relationships. I was single for ages before I met my girlfriend. Single so long, got so lonely, so desperate. In the end, I made myself a Lego sex doll. <laughs> ah. And I'll tell you what, I loved it a bit. You write for this comic, don't you? Um, or you have I done. I might be, I might be uh, over-exaggerating it slightly, but yeah, I've had various bits and pieces in there. Well, that's more than I've had. Uh, yeah, I've... Uh, Never got the free pencil they supposedly give you, though. <laughs> well, there was one which had um, uh, Im important people on the Kazi, and my one was uh, Scylla Black, and she's outside uh, uh, singing Step Inside Love and We. And I, I oh. wondered if I'd get five pounds for that. What do you reckon? Yeah, yeah I, I think, think it's worth a fiver. It's worth, it's, worth, it's, worth, it's worth a phone call, isn't it? It's worth sending it in. Yeah. <laughs> so what, were you, were you all sort of, uh, again, more... Um, uh, top yeah, mine tips were or... just the, like top top tips and and letters and a few bits and pieces. Letterbox. Yeah, I can't, I can't really remember. I, I, it's funny, like people say, because obviously I do a lot of one-liners. People say, "Oh, you must have a really good memory for for your jokes and everything." And I have an appalling memory. Mm. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes people will um, tell me like my jokes, or they'll ask me about my jokes, and I won't have any recollection of that I've, I've had people before now quote jokes back to me and i've gone ah it's a great joke whose joke is that and they've, and they've gone that's one of yours <laughs> brilliant brilliant <laughs> like really oh and then i've looked back through like my records on my computer or notebooks and going oh yeah that's a really good joke i don't know why i don't do that anymore <laughs> it's purely because i've forgotten them i love it i love it scratch and sniff Online. with nick randall Now, um, I have a little idea. I'm going to spring on you a little bit. Um, well, quite a lot, actually. Uh, I have a paper cup here with various words written on individual pieces of paper. 
Right. And because I've heard you're such a, a quick-witted chap, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm probably testing you because it's like the end of a long day for, for both of us. But um, I'm going to just, if you're okay with it, take out, I would say, three per um, go and just see if you can okay. string something together. And if you can't, you know, we will we will understand. We will forgive you. <laughs> But we will just okay, be rather let's... quietly disappointed. So um, yeah, let's I'm... see how this goes. <laughs> okay, so I, I've got yeah, I've got loads in here. So let me just take the first one out. Um, Hancock. I don't know if that means uh, Hancock's half hour or the other guy. Um, oh, Hancock. Well, oh, hang on, I haven't finished is... yet. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to do two more, and you've got to string them together. Or is that too much? Oh my word! I've never. I'm not sure I've ever done that before. Oh. Oh, how... I, I usually just get when because I sometimes do this on Twitter and I do it live occasionally where I get mm. audiences to give me a subject. Ah, a, a subject. Joke. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever I've ever tied. Let's just two or see three if you could. Together. Let's see how I'm going to take one more out. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. Hancock and and dolphin. Hancock and dolphin. <laughs> I really landed you in it, boy. <laughs> oh my word! I think you're really uh, doing this on purpose, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, I'm actually a rival comedian. Right. I just want to, uh, yeah. you know, take you down a peg or two. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, we can start with Hancock sure if you want. I... Yeah, well, Hancock... He was at the zoo. He was Hancock, at the zoo to really. sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Hancock. laughs> just start it at the zoo, watch it with dolphins, and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> he was... It was a, well, it reminds me of it. It's kind of obviously... His famous sketch is the blood donor, isn't it? And Because, uh, uh, of course, my motto... In so life you're, going, always... you're going for, for that, Hancock, not Matt? Not Matt Hancock. Oh, well, yeah, I'd forgotten all about Matt Hancock. Which probably <laughs> He's still around, isn't he? Um, no, Tony Hancock, isn't it? Because mm. um, cause my, this is sort of tangentially related, but my motto in life is always give 100%, which makes blood donation very tricky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blimey. That's, whole, that's a whole body full. Yeah. But hey, there you go. Have that one on me. Shall I do another one? Yeah. Are you, are you yeah, sure? Perhaps, perhaps, one, perhaps one at a time. I'm not entirely I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, do it, I'll, do it very, I'll do it very slowly, mate. Um, oh, well, two words, one person. Noel Edmonds. Noel Edmonds? <laughs> a little bit random. They're okay. all quite okay. random things written down. Okay. Um, let me see if I can think of something Hang on, because this is what happens is I hear something like that and then all little processes, little cogs were in my brain. Um, the only the, the only thing I could come up with that is that uh, Noel Edmonds, um, of course, was uh, I don't know if you know this, but he was uh, for a little while he was one of the suspects in the assassination of JFK. Oh yeah, which is why he was known as Grassy Noel. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's all right. Is that all right? I'll give you that. A bit tenuous, isn't it? Well, you know what can I say? But no, I liked but it. Off the top of my head, and it sort of fits in with um, where did he was he Dingley Dell on the radio. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do one more. Do one more. Yeah, go for it. One more. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Oh. <laughs> well, these are three words. Sword of Damocles. Sword of Damocles. <laughs> well, uh, God, I don't, want, I don't want that hanging over my head. Really. Hey! hey. <laughs> I love it. That, no, yeah, that'll do. You can come again. Is that all right? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, but the test is over. <laughs> you can relax now. That, that was, I have to say, that, that was that was tough, though. I found that quite yeah, tough. Yeah, you Thank go. you for the challenge. I lived on a houseboat for a little while as well. Yeah, I was uh, seeing the girl next door, but eventually we drifted apart. <laughs> I, I did a lot of studying when I was younger. Actually, I actually studied to become a locksmith. Yeah, I uh, studied at Yale. <laughs> I tell you, that opened a lot of doors for me. I tell you. <laughs> no, actually, I, st I studied medicine at university. I did study uh, medicine. You'll be relieved to know that I failed my medical degree, though, because I made a real mess of my human dissection. Yeah, that was, uh, that was autopsy turvy. <laughs> Went into a bookshop recently. This confused me. Right in the travel section, I had a book. It was just called 101 Places to Visit Before You Die. Yeah, didn't suggest a hospital. Do a lot of travelling, doing this job, do a lot of travelling, and uh, I, I love travelling, it's brilliant, broadens the mind and everything, but I'm not a fan of Germany, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, not a fan of Germany. So I had a bad experience there as a child, 
on a family holiday when my dad nearly choked to death on a German sausage. <laughs> After that, we feared the worst. We do. <laughs> So I'm presuming last year and to a lesser extent this year has been tough for you um, gig-wise. Uh, how has that been for you? And also, how do you see the future, COVID permitting? Um, yeah, it's been it's been very difficult because kind of at, at times this year, I felt like, um, felt like a, a blacksmith who was working at the time when cars just suddenly took off um, <laughs> in that my job all ceased to exist almost overnight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of moved online, which has been kind of fun, but but doesn't obviously um, replace all the live gigs I was doing, uh, no. and obviously sort of all the avenues. Because I obviously, as well as doing stand up, I do a lot of writing. But of course, no one else is touring or really making shows, and mm. and that. So that's kind of died off. So it's been it's been a very very tricky year. For, yeah. Obviously. Sure. I'm not not alone in that. Lots of people in in lots of different mm. industries have, have found it difficult. But yeah, it's no, it's been quite a quite a tough year. But say 2021, and we're a little bit more optimism. We got Biden in. We hopefully we have vanquished COVID. What's the long term plans for you? What you know, any sort of ambitions you haven't sort of yet achieved, or you just keep doing what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm one of these people that that has. I think one of the reasons I got into stand up is is because I have lots of ideas all the time mm. and don't always have the organizational skills or or whatever to see them through so i've got I've got a million different projects all percolating at the, at the moment, and so hopefully I can home in on one or two of them and and see if I can get the uh like I've got ideas for radio shows and like I said, I have got ideas for sort of a TV sitcom on that sort of thing. Mm. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's just getting back to gigging and, and touring. Getting back to it is going to be interesting because I hadn't not gigged for that length of time mm. since I started doing stand-up. Wow. The most I'd probably ever not gigged was maybe two weeks. Um, so to not gig for eight, nine, ten weeks, whatever it was, um, it it was quite sort of a, I suppose like a like a footballer coming back after a long injury it was mm. um, took a little while to get back up to speed fully but then I suppose it gave you time more time with your family because that was one of the things I was going to ask about you know if you're traveling all the time I mean did, did you put them all in a suitcase with you <laughs> <laughs> um it was quite interesting being at home on sort of Friday and Saturday nights and you know to watch telly with the family and and do those sort of things was was really good fun to kind of reconnect a bit Mm. um because i I don't mind the travel a lot of comedians really don't like the traveling but i don't mind the travel but it can be a bit lonely sometimes yeah yeah i i quite like it it's it's my time to myself i listen to a lot of podcasts and things and radio shows and and that and and that's when sometimes after a good gig and your mind's racing is when you come up with quite a lot of joke ideas and ideas for things brilliant um, so yeah, it was quite different not doing. My car, I think, was happy for the rest. It, it sort of uh, has done a, a tiny fraction of the amount of mileage yes. it would have normally done. <laughs> so let's just um, uh, plug your uh, various uh, details for the Great British Public and beyond. Um, it's TonyCowards.co.uk. Your website. Um, it is. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I've no idea what kind of state that's in at the moment. I should. Have it doesn't look too bad. To, is it? Is it look all right? Is, it's a bit threadbare like, on. Uh, it's a bit threadbare yeah. on the gig front, but that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's been updated for a while. Um, so I tend to direct people just to my Twitter. Really, that's where, because my Twitter, as you know, is, is mostly jokes. But I do occasionally plug stuff on there. So if people want to know where I'm gigging, um, at Tony Cowards on Twitter. Tony Cowards, thank you so much for uh, chatting to me today. Um, it only remains as we do with all our, our guests, but uh, you get a celebrity goodie bag. Um, I can't give it to you in person because of the current restrictions, <laughs> but if we get your details later, something gorgeous will be winging its way through the post to you, sir. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to that. <laughs> Tony Cowards, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. One of my biggest questions, though, right, this genuinely keeps me awake at night, 
is uh, what to call the underneath of an elephant. Right? What, what, is, what is the technical term? What is the technical term for the underneath of an elephant? What would, anyone, what would you say? What would, what would you say? Say, say stomach? Yeah, stomach. Some people say stomach. Some people say belly, underbelly, torso, abdomen. No one really knows, do they? There's no agreed term for the underneath of an elephant. No, it's a huge grey area. <laughs> well done for sticking with it. That was a long build-up for that punchline. Well done. snsonlineshow.com your brand new one-stop shop for all things sns take a tour through our wide and diverse collection of shows and listen in to our exclusive range of in-depth interviews spanning the popular arts featuring actors writers journalists stand-up comedians musicians and more you can also enjoy our shorter bite-sized series covering vibrant new theater television and book releases and with our Arts Lifestyle Remit, you get to explore issue-based topics, including health, mental health, women's rights around the world, and LGBTQ. Contact us with both your comments and suggestions for future guests. And don't forget to read up on our blog, regularly updated with articles and photographs. A forum where everyone is welcome to contribute. snsonlineshow.com, your one-stop shop for all things SNS. SNS.